In Maine, Northeast America, lives a family that carries a deadly burden. In every generation, half of them face an early and traumatic death. But they don't know who it will strike, or when. It's an awful thing to watch. Here they're watching their father, and then this could happen to them. Joanne White recently lost her husband to the disease, and now her children face the same fate. This could be me. I just live every day for what it is, because you don't know. You don't know. Just 30 families in the world are known to carry the killer gene. It was discovered by an Italian doctor who witnessed its unique and devastating effects. They are overcome by hallucinations, by births of dreams, by a deadly tiredness, and then they die. The victims yearn for sleep, but are condemned to perpetual insomnia. Now Joanne is taking her children to California, where they can find out if they carry the lethal gene. I know this is really hard. And to help find a cure, before they are struck down too. 30 seconds left, Megan. Keep going. The human brain cannot function without sleep. It's as vital to it as food and drink. The brain itself is about 3% of our total body weight, but it uses up about 25% of our oxygen and our food. It's like a highly tuned, very fast racing engine, uh, and uh, it can't really relax to any extent in wakefulness. And, and the only way it can go offline or relax to any extent for a necessary rest is in sleep. But there's one disease whose sufferers are totally deprived of sleep. They're condemned to inhabit a dreadful limbo between sleep and wake, until finally their bodies give up. For centuries, they were simply thought to be mad and condemned to die in lunatic asylums. But the mysterious condition now has a name, thanks to the dedication of one man on a personal crusade. In Italy, finding a cure for the disease is the life work of Dr. Ignazio Reuter, for 30 years, he's watched it wreak havoc on a family in Venice. They've been so devastated by it that they keep their identity secret. Dr. Reuter has been trying to discover how long the disease has been stalking them. The family has lived in the Venice area since about 1500. Whether the illness goes back that far, nobody knows. As the family dispersed, the pattern of their untimely deaths passed unnoticed. The records show that some died young, from depression it was said, or other mysterious causes. But they never made a connection between these deaths. The disease is so rare and so hard to diagnose that it has only recently acquired a name. Fatal familial insomnia. Dr. Reuter first witnessed its curious symptoms in 1974, when a woman from the affected family came to his surgery. She was complaining of giddiness, and she walked unsteadily. But at that stage, it never occurred to me that it might be a neurological illness, or one so terrible. The disease robbed her of all control over her body. After nine months, unable to swallow or speak, she died. Two years later, her sister began to suffer the same disturbing symptoms. The most striking was a complete inability to sleep. No one can imagine, not even I who've witnessed it, what it's like to be completely deprived of sleep. To have only tiny chaotic fragments of sleep, being totally at its mercy, and to die utterly exhausted. 
observing the two sisters' unusual but identical symptoms. The doctor drew an alarming conclusion. Clearly, the illness was genetic. In Maine, in the northeastern corner of the USA, is a family coming to terms with the same chilling realization. Three years ago, the white children lost their father, Rick, to fatal familial insomnia. It was a shock to the whole community. We lost a co-worker and a friend last night. Rick White was our assistant news director. We were blessed to have a good friend who made every day that he was here better. Two years earlier, former cameraman Rick White had become the news assignment editor at his local TV station in Bangor, Maine. He'd been at the peak of his mental powers. We work with rigid deadlines. We have several newscasts, a morning, a noon, two night, uh, three night newscasts. Rick was the guy behind that. He was, he was the brains behind that. 22, they're putting that clock up today. So we have a VO from there. But after just a year, Rick White seemed to be drifting. Michael was going up to Orono today. He'd have days where he just really wasn't there. He, he didn't, um, didn't contribute. He did not uh, stay focused. At one point, he came to me and apologized for being off his game, he said. And at that point, I thought, he's either ill physically in some way, you know, maybe he has a cold or something. I noticed there was a tickle in his throat. He coughed a lot. At home, Rick's children were increasingly disturbed by their father's persistent cough. The cough just didn't go away. And then he started having pains in his legs. And then just they think they'd all just come together. It was bizarre that nothing was working. And I don't know, something inside of me went off and said, this is it. Dad's got it. She was right to be dismayed. Her dad had the illness that had killed many in their family before him. We knew that he wasn't going to get better. It was, it's just hard to know that and then not really be able to do anything about it. Nine months after he caught the cough that wouldn't go away, Rick White died. When Rick was sick, the kids were, you know, I got thinking, here they're watching their father, and then this could happen to them. Now their mother, Joanne, has embarked on a mission to discover more about the disease and to find out what chance there is of a cure being found in time to save her children. Fatal familial insomnia is a deadly brain disease that lies dormant in its victims for up to 50 years. Once it becomes active, it's unstoppable. It condemns its victims to perpetual sleeplessness until it kills them. It was first noticed only 30 years ago in a family from Venice. Even then, its symptoms were a mystery. But after seeing two sisters from a family die from it, Dr. Ignazio Reuter suspected it was genetic. In his quest for evidence, he went to the island of San Servolo, a mile off the Venetian coast, to search the archives of one of Italy's first lunatic asylums. From talking to relatives, I found that at least one ancestor, and maybe more, had been treated there, believed to be murdered. The archive contains daily reports on all those who were treated here. With help from the curator, Dr. Reuter found medical records for family members dating back to the 1800s. They described symptoms that echoed those he had seen in the two sisters. Disorientato nel tempo, la sua attenzione è esauribile. Il paziente è goffo e lento nei movimenti. How this illness could wind like a serpent through the generations without ever being noticed is a historical mystery. The ancient records seem to confirm it was genetic. But to investigate it further, Dr. Reuter would have to wait until the deadly disease struck the family again. In Maine, the White family know from Dr. Reuter's research that the disease which killed their father runs in their genes.
At least 15 of their relatives have died from it. Yet the family has never spoken about the dark secret that threatens them all. You know, but still it wasn't really talked about a lot. Kind of stay in denial of it, being afraid of, of what was to come. Now Joanne has invited over members of Rick's family. She wants to find out more about the mysterious illness that killed her husband and now threatens her children. Today, for the first time, the family is revealing its secrets. Cousin Marilyn lists a shocking death toll amongst her relatives. Barbara, my mother, died of the disease as well as her sister Joyce, her sister Joanne, they were twins and her brother Donald, another brother Paul. I've also lost three first cousins to the disease. If there's something, an ache or a pain that lasts for two or three days, then I automatically think this is it. I, I, have, I have the disease, this is the beginning. It's always there. We inherit about half our genes from each of our parents. So where one parent has the fatal insomnia gene, each child has a 50-50 chance of inheriting it. You have one gene that has FFI on it. You have a second gene from your unaffected parent that usually pairs up with that. If you get the good gene, you don't have the disease. If you get the gene with the FFI, you get FFI. But chance was not kind to the White's Aunt Judy. I married into the family, my husband's family. He passed away, and then my son passed away, and my daughter. And I'm thankful we had no more. If I'd known it was there, I would not have had children. Because I think that's not a gift you want to give to an unborn child. To help Megan and Andy, their grandfather, Graydon White, has put together a family tree hoping to jog memories and to find out where it all started. So, what do the red stars mean for you? The red stars are the ones that had the disease. And they died from it? And they died from it. Graydon lost not only his son Rick to the disease, but his wife too. Our genetic malfunction, if you might, comes down here. We realized over the years that there must be a reason for this. Somewhere there was a genetic deviant, if you will, and we want to, want to find it. There's a, a, a very wealthy Italian family doing the same thing. Eight years after Dr. Reuter watched helplessly as two sisters from the Italian family succumbed to the disease, their brother, Silvano, appeared at his surgery. In 1983, I saw the first symptoms of the disease in the younger brother of the two sisters who had died. He sweated a lot, and he said he slept very little. So I gave him some sedatives, but they only made him worse. Fearing for his patient's life, he turned in desperation to one of Italy's top neurologists. I got a call from a doctor from the Venice area. He told me about a patient of his who was showing symptoms of a rapidly progressive illness. The thing that particularly got me interested was these people died because they were no longer able to sleep. He immediately replied, come tomorrow, so I guess he believed me. Or maybe he realized how desperate I was. Within a week, his patient, Silvano, was in the care of the Bologna Hospital neurologists. The shots they recorded to study his condition are part of an extremely rare archive. Resigned to death, he wanted only to help the doctors find a cure for future victims. He had seen the course of the disease, 
and he knew very well that he was going to end in death. He said, consider me as a guinea pig in order to know about this uh, disease, this curse which runs my family. I must say he was a very, very, very brave uh, man. The disease and the stigma of madness that it inflicts on its victims have caused the Italian family such anguish that they have chosen to remain anonymous. The doctors in Bologna monitored Silvano's sleep pattern over several 24-hour periods. The patient really was always awake. Not real uh, clear wakefulness, but he could not sleep. But remarkably, Silvano did appear to dream. Silvano, ogni tanto, Every now and again, Silvano made some simple gesture, like combing his hair or buttoning up his pajamas. And once, he even gave a kind of military salute. I asked him, what was that about? He said, I was dreaming that I was a guard at the coronation of Queen Elizabeth. So how come Silvano was dreaming, but not sleeping? Sleep can be divided into three basic types. Light sleep, deep sleep, and REM sleep, or dreaming sleep. So it is in REM sleep that we dream. The function of dreams is not really understood. The REM sleep produces artificial noise, and it might be that uh, your brain is trying to make sense of this artificial stimulation and creating the dream around it. REM stands for the rapid eye movements, which characterize our dream sleep. But when we dream, our brain does not rest. I see it more as a sort of a non-wakefulness rather than a sleep. doesn't provide an adequate form of recovery uh, and it is no substitute for real or deep sleep. Silvano was literally dying for real sleep. Even the specialists who treated him had never seen anything like it. This patient never had any deep sleep, the really refreshing type of sleep. His eyelids would droop as if he wanted to sleep, but he couldn't. The fact is, our brain cannot function without sleep. The brain contains billions and billions of neurons. It requires a huge amount of our energy, and uh, it needs sleep because of the, the important parts of our brain, the higher centers, the cortex, work so hard in wakefulness. And the only opportunity for the brain to actually go offline or relax at any extent is by sleeping. It can't do it any other way. Silvano was deprived of deep sleep for eight months. His relentless insomnia indicated that his brain was malfunctioning. In the last weeks of his life, it sent his body into overdrive. By the end, he was just a living torso, animated by continuous muscle contortions and twitchings, which were caused by the enormous increase in his vegetative activity. And after months of this hyperactivity, the end came rapidly. Professor Lugarese was determined to find out what had caused the bizarre and painful cocktail of symptoms that killed Silvano. He turned to a former student who now worked in Cleveland, Ohio, and who boasts one of the largest collections of diseased brains in the United States. He called me and said, we have a, a, new, a case of a new disease uh, characterized by the loss of ability to sleep. I said, Gambetti, immerse yourself in this case. Drop everything else. Focus on this, because we will make a great discovery. Dr. Gambetti grasped the opportunity. Being such an important brain, one of the residents uh, who was in our laboratory flew to Bologna to carry the brain. The instructions from Bologna were clear. We said, look in detail in the brainstem, look in detail in the hypothalamus. We were wrong. We were completely wrong. 
20 years ago, it was believed that sleep was controlled from within these areas, deep down at the back of the brain. The brain stem was examined very, very carefully, and yet uh, no detectable lesions were seen there. However, it uh, became very apparent that uh, a very severe lesion was present in the thalamus. So Although frightened, Megan is putting on a brave face. I found it to be very difficult, but in the long run I knew that I, I can do it, and it's, it's all for the better for everybody. I mean, my family, and the next, and my father. I think that's it. Okay. And as quickly as you can. But it seems that was the easy part. Tests get more intense as Andy's brain is wired up to a magnetoencephalography scanner, or MEG. Escalator. Dark. The MEG records brain activity by picking up magnetic fields generated by our nerve cells. Cactus. Megan is preparing for an EEG. Electrodes glued to her head monitor her brain waves. With each test, the children are becoming increasingly nervous that an abnormality will appear. But at any point, the hospital chaperone again. sees Megan is not comfortable. So if you really don't want to do it, I'm not going to twist your arm. I'm just on emotional overload right now. Um, Megan bravely tries to keep going with the test. You're halfway done, Megan. But by now, she's in obvious distress. Dr. Geshwind is alerted. He asks the camera crew to step out of the room. After talking with Megan, he calls a halt to the EEG exam. It's all proving tougher than Megan expected. Even though they're very young, maybe we will find something that's not normal. The thought of that is very emotionally charged for, for them. I thought that I was mentally prepared to deal with all this. I couldn't wait to get out here and when I got, you know, in the hospital, things changed rapidly for me and found that I wasn't aware, I guess, how deep things would would hit me. Andy, too, is losing his resolve. He's a pretty quiet, private person. He doesn't share his thoughts a lot. So this has been difficult for him. So um, I'm here to do some cognitive testing, and I uh, just wanted to touch base with you about how the day's going. I think I'm, I'm pretty exhausted right now. I think I'd actually rather either do it tomorrow or just take a pass on that. Mm -hmm. I really just need a good night's sleep right now. I can understand that. Megan and Andy probably didn't realize all that it was going to take and all that it was going to bring out for them to kind of relive things and, and think about it and then think about themselves and possibly, you know, their future. In tackling the family disease head on, Andy and Megan face difficult choices, as other patients of Dr. Geshwind have before them. Touch your chin and then my finger. Good. How about the other arm? Touch in June 2005, Dr. Geshwind received a referral from the state of Utah. Diane Stroiling had rapid dementia. The doctors back home suspected CJD, but her symptoms didn't quite match the diagnosis. Read these words for me. Mama tipped down. When we examined her, her thinking was relatively spared. Prion disease was certainly in the differential. However, in her case, the MRI did not show the typical changes that we've recently seen in patients with sporadic Kreutzfeldt-Jakob disease, or CJD. Diane Stroiling lived in the town of Provo in Utah. Okay, she was in the prime of life when suddenly struck down by a mystery illness. I remember her walking down the halls and having to balance, hold onto the walls to balance. And at that point, she was having some trouble with her memory. The doctors were baffled. None of the treatments they gave Diane slowed her decline. All right. Do you want to get your thumbs messy? <laughs> when Addie and Kelsey and I would go.
go visit grandma, we would make cookies together. And as her illness progressed, I noticed that she had a more difficult time. Each time we went, it was more difficult for her to manipulate her hands. But we still had fun together. Diane remained positive throughout her illness, but her body could not resist the disease. You see them wanting to try so hard, you know, but their body won't let them. You know, first uh, balance, then uh, the ability to walk, then uh, the ability to uh, uh, swallow and speak. And when you think about how vivacious she was and uh, what she ended up to be, that's the sad part of this disease. On July the 30th, 2005, just two hours after her daughter Jennifer gave birth to her third child, Devon, Diane died. I told uh, Diane that Devon was here and that he was healthy and that Jennifer was doing fine and that if she wanted to, she could go now. Diane's body was sent for autopsy. Her doctors had been baffled by the illness that took her life. By chance, her post-mortem was conducted by an expert in rare neurological disorders. To our surprise, when we examined the microscopic sections of her brain, and in particular the thalamus, we noticed that there was a remarkable loss of neuronal cells. This was a classic sign of fatal insomnia. But the disease is not always genetic. There is also a non-genetic form. When Dr. Chin reported back to Diane's family, he didn't know which form she had had. He said that she had died of an illness called fatal insomnia, and that there was a genetic form and a sporadic form. And as soon as he said genetic, of course, I became quite concerned, having seen what my mom had gone through and worrying about um, having that happen to me and the possibility of that happening to my Look at that big one. Sporadic fatal insomnia occurs randomly. <laughs> Nobody knows how its victims contract it. But it's far rarer than even the genetic familial form. <laughs> Watch what Grandpa's going to do, and then you have to do the same thing, see? Okay, put, it, put, it, put your hand flat. A gene test on Diane's mother would show whether the disease was the genetic form. But could Jennifer bear to find out? When you were smaller, you were a little bit afraid of doing that. Just... In San Francisco, Andy and Megan White also have the chance to learn if they carry the fatal insomnia gene. They know it's likely that at least one of them does. After five hours of medical scrutiny at the University of California hospital, they meet the genetic counselor, whose job is to make them fully aware of the implications of taking the gene test. First, what I would like to do is to take a full family history. Recounting the family history is painful. The genetics. One of the, the uncles that died in his 40s, he had two children okay. that both died from that. Okay. And how old were they? 26, the oh. male, the male. And were there any other health issues besides the FFI? Oh, yeah. yes, he had cerebral palsy. Megan and Andy are now in their 20s as their cousin was when he got fatal insomnia. Um, and the early ones tend to have other issues. You know, not always, but they tend to have other issues. Um, I know this is really hard. Well, and... Megan um, has juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. Okay. Okay. And not so the I... same kind of issue. Okay? Okay, so that's... Yeah. Next, Jill Goldman turned to the question of gene testing. Her prognosis was unambiguous. There is a 50-50 um, risk of inheriting the disease gene or of inheriting the normal gene. Okay? And it literally is a flip of the coin. You could both not have it. 
or as in your grandmother's generation, you know, you could both have it. The only way we can figure this out is by you know, taking blood and sequencing the gene. So this kind of inheritance... Megan and Andy have a serious dilemma. Should they take the blood test that will reveal their fate? Should they take the blood test that will reveal their fate? Jennifer Jones faced the same tough choice after her mother died of fatal insomnia. But when she met the doctor who had detected it, he was optimistic. Based on Diane's lack of family history of unusual neurologic disorders, it was unlikely that she had a genetic form of fatal insomnia. I asked him why that would necessarily be an indication that it wasn't the genetic form because certainly the, the disease would have to start somewhere. It would have to start with someone with one person's genes being mutated. I stressed to her that we could not be absolutely sure at that time without a genetic test. Before she died, Diane had given a sample of blood. Jennifer now wanted it tested for the presence of the fatal insomnia gene. She waited 10 anxious days for the result. The DNA study indicated that there were no mutations uh, present in uh, Diane's genes. It was like a, this great burden was lifted off my shoulders. I remember the relief that I felt at hearing that. So now I, I and my children would be at no further risk of contracting the disease. Diane was only the eighth person in the world to be diagnosed with sporadic fatal insomnia. Jennifer and her children were in the clear. Now Megan and Andy White face the same tough decision. They've undergone a series of tests to help doctors learn more about their rare condition. But they have one last task. They must decide whether to take the test, which will establish beyond doubt if they carry the fatal gene. It's the toughest dilemma they've ever faced. Being from a family with a deadly genetic disease, Megan and Andy White will always live in fear of the sleep disorder, fatal familial insomnia, that killed their father and 14 other close relations. Having a test to find out for certain could free them from that fear, or condemn them to a life waiting for the disease to attack. First up for the test is Megan. I'm gonna wash my hands. We have to be very careful when doing a genetic test. A patient could become depressed, not only depressed, it's possible they could think about suicide, about ending their life. I just can't watch it. Some people may not be emotionally prepared for the genetic results. <clears throat> In the end, Megan decides to give the blood sample, but not to know the result yet. After much deliberation, Andy decides not even to have his blood taken. But Megan and he both know that before long they'll have to confront the issue head on. Getting married is probably the thing that is going to force me to really look at the issue head on. I wouldn't want to put a child through the difficulties that I had to go through, whether it be what watching their own father go through the illness and then potentially them having to go through the same thing themselves. The only thing that would make me weigh my decision would be if I wanted to have children, which I do. Because I don't want it to keep going. I really don't. And I don't think anyone else should have to suffer it. Great advances are being made in the ability to identify genetic defects but with them could come new problems. The goal is to identify the entire human genome. Uh, does that mean that if your genetic material doesn't match the standard human genome, you become uninsurable, you become unemployable? That's probably a radical slant to it, but it may affect your life, your employability, uh, marriage, uh, numerous problems. 
The good news is that research like that continuing in San Francisco and Italy could mean that even if Andy and Megan do carry the mutant gene, there's a real hope that by the time it becomes active, there'll be a treatment for it in their lifetime. The bad news is that with more diseases identified as having a genetic component, the dilemma facing the whites could face millions of families.